Hey everyone, today's episode is transformation time. And as you can tell, um, I'm actually in the middle of setting up my new workspace for my networking events and for my lives. So this is my new chair. Soon you're gonna see a nice backdrop. So I'm kind of excited for you guys to see. I think the networking event view is gonna be a lot of fun, how it's gonna look. We have a nice accent wall coming in. So I'm excited for you guys to see that. But let's get started with transformation time. So transformation time is all about our guest speaker's journey, their mindset shifts. So I think the reason why I started this show is just because you start realizing as you get into real estate entrepreneurship, you realize how important it is to actually, like the fundamentals of everything is your mindset. If you don't change your mindset, you don't, won't advance, or you'll just really stop yourself from doing things. So let me see, I can see that Alan is on. He is our guest speaker, so just give me a second. Uh, hold on, how are we doing this here? Oh, there we go. Okay. Hey, I see your screen, okay. <laughs> hey, how are you? <laughs> hey, Diane, I'm good, how about you? Good, good. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. I'm excited to hear about your journey, your real estate journey, your personal development, uh, your mindset, sorry. Uh, like I was saying before, it's always a lot of fun to just hear people's stories uh, so that we can relate and understand and just um, be able to look up, look to other people, you know, to to see that we're not the only ones struggling, you know, like everyone is going through their struggles or different kind of changes. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for the invite. Glad to be here. Awesome. So let's start with just letting the viewers know a little bit about yourself. How is your real estate and entrepreneurship journey right now? Where are you at? So I'm active in the Windsor marketplace. I'm focused on uh, wholesaling and flipping for the active income. I also have uh, a rental property. So looking to acquire more units on the, on that side as well. But uh, yeah, I've been pretty active in the Windsor marketplace for the last couple of years and just looking to expand and grow and uh, yeah, just grow the business and, and, you know, so awesome. yeah. And so what got you, what even got you thinking about real estate and just thinking that, for example, this is the avenue that you want to go to? I think it started with a book that most of us are familiar with, The Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So I read that back in college and it was definitely a big mindset shift. Uh, growing up, you know, everyone asks you, like, what do you want to do? Uh, what kind of job you want to get into? And most of the time, a lot of people, including myself, had no clue. Right. And then once I read that book and I was actually in school for nursing, I think it made a lot of sense. Like, hey, this is kind of the direction I want to go in. Uh, it took a while to to do my first real estate deal, but that's kind of what started off for me um, and just continuing to educate myself, invest in myself, uh, go to seminars, read books, listen to uh, podcasts and whatnot. And that kind of brought me into the real estate aspect. That's awesome. Yeah. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I think is all of us get corrupted with that book, right? It's just so amazing. It blows your mind and you're just like, why didn't I know this? <laughs> yeah, definitely life changing uh, book for sure. And uh, yeah, after you read it, it seems like it's common sense, but it, it really isn't right. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that was really instrumental for me to kind of pivot and say, you know what, I don't want to be a nurse. I want to you know, get into business, get into real estate and uh, took some time, but finally, you know, made that leap. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's a full time real estate, right? Yeah. So I left uh, the nine to five uh, about a year ago. Um, so definitely a big transition. Um, I thought it was going to take a lot longer. I think most people, the way that they want to leave their nine to five is through the passive income. Uh, we think, you know, you get enough rental properties, eventually that passive income will replace your full-time uh, income. And uh, I quickly realized through my mentor that uh, that's a very slow way to do it. Uh, it's just very slow and capital intensive. And the way that I was able to, to do that is through active investing. So uh, focused on the, the wholesaling, the flipping, 
and uh, the active was able to replace my full time income. And then it got to the point where um, it didn't make sense to go to work anymore because the active was just replaced the income. It felt like I'm losing out on opportunity by clocking in. 100% completely agree. And you're giving so much information. So I'm going to back up track a little because you're giving like so much. And I actually want to touch on some points. So you said that you were in nursing. And I'm very curious at what skills do you feel like nursing gave you to help you that helped you, let's say, with your real estate journey? Or even just as young, like uh, skills that maybe that maybe didn't come from nursing, but as young, like what skills do you feel like helped you really advance in your real estate journey? Yeah, I don't know how many of the skills from nursing kind of uh, relates to real estate, especially because in nursing, I wasn't in it for too long. After a year and a half, I dropped out and kind of moved out west and took my life into a different direction. Uh, but definitely like people skills, um, like real estate is a people business. You're always talking to buyers and sellers. So uh, all the other things that I did after nursing, different uh, sales jobs, commission, different entrepreneur uh, ventures, those things I feel uh, really helped um, in, in terms of real estate, you know, getting the leads, talking to people on the phone, presenting an offer, building rapport. So after re after nursing, I did a year as a financial planner, which is basically a commission sales job. So stuff like that and working in the car uh, industry in Alberta, those two things plus uh, multi-level marketing um, didn't make a whole lot of money uh, through those you know various ventures, but I definitely learned skills such as marketing and sales and negotiating that have been super helpful. That's amazing. And yeah, that's very true. I mean, and maybe you thought, did you do that because of Rich Dad Poor Dad? Because I mean, they also talk about that, you know, that he went working into like sales jobs just to like learn the area. Did you purposely do that or it just came about? I think it just came about because I've always been kind of interested in entrepreneurship and business and I didn't really know it until I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. And then that kind of opened my eyes like, okay, like this kind of makes sense. And it was just try to uh, take advantage of an opportunity, whether that was uh, multi-level marketing um, or the you know financial planning or whatnot. It was all about kind of that financial freedom that we're all after. And those vehicles weren't really the, the right fit for me at the time, but it definitely helped uh, build that skill set that allowed me to have some success in real estate. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And another point that you, you spoke about before that I also want to touch on because I think this is what really uh, makes people continue or stop is that you're taking it took you a while to get like your first deal done and I feel like that's a big struggle for people to kind of keep on trugging along and being like you haven't seen anything happen and still continue and just kind of improve yourself and make change so i'm curious if you could talk about that like how you felt like the struggles you went through and then obviously the success and finally getting your first one yeah so a lot happened between reading that book and then actually doing the first deal even after reading the book i thought i was going to go out west work in the oil field i know you can make a lot of money there and my thought process was okay i'll, I'll make good money and then i'll buy the real estate um but then I, I invested in myself, which was the main thing. So actually, I, I signed up with a Rich Dad seminar. So uh, I was living in Edmonton. There was some ad on, uh, I think it was Facebook, actually, free real estate course training for the weekend. I'm like, cool, I'll check that out. I know Rich Dad. I like you know what they're about. So I went to go see that, and it was like a free you know two-hour thing. And then it's like, hey, we'll teach you more, but it's going to be for the weekend. It's going to cost you 600 bucks. So I'm like, okay, you know, I'll pay the 600 bucks. I, I want to get them more info. And then I, so I did that. I got some more info and then they upsold us again. And then uh, it was actually a very expensive course. The minimum was like 10,000 to get in the very lowest uh, course and went all the way up to 50,000. And it was crazy because I've been looking around the room and people are signing up for all these different levels. And at the time I was broke, I didn't have any money. So um, I actually had to go back and convince a buddy of mine to lend me the money um, to get me into that course. And I finally sold him on the idea. And then I actually had to call the instructor and go back to the hotel and track him down and said, I'm in. So then 
Uh, I signed up for, with them, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. There was a couple of courses that was included with that. And that really opened my eyes to real estate and see what's possible. People buying houses without any of their own money and whatnot. So that's what really got me interested. Um, but even after that, it took me another probably couple of years to do that first deal. Uh, you know, life happens. I decided to change direction, leave the oil field, leave the uh, car business in Alberta, go back to Windsor, my hometown, to go to school. But since I spent all that money on that course, I spent like 10 grand. Um, and it was just always in the back of my mind, like I have to... I have to do a deal. Like it was always creeping in the back of my mind. I went back to school. So that kind of distracted me, different ventures. Uh, but it was always in the back of my mind. And every once in a while, I'd come across a for sale by owner. I'd inquire about the property. I'd uh, even make an offer. But I was kind of spinning my wheels. Didn't really know what I was doing. And then it took a few more things to happen. For me, I went to an event in Toronto. Uh, it was kind of random. But I met an investor from Windsor that was doing very well. At the time, he had like 100 doors. And uh, he was always looking for deals. So I got in touch with him. And then a few months later, driving for dollars, came across a for sale by owner, uh, motivated seller, property needed some work. I called the investor that I met in Toronto, said, hey, I got a possible deal. He came by and uh, yeah, he took it. So that was my very first uh, deal. It was a wholesale or an assignment. That was end of 2019 and it closed January, 2020. Amazing. And so... Did you feel very frustrated, like with the amount of time and you know that it took you, or or like what kept you even just motivated to to go? Was it like the money, like you spent the ten thousand, and um, like you just had to do something, you know, with that money that was spent? Yeah, I think it was a uh, a few different factors. That was definitely one of them. It's like I spent all this money on this damn course. I gotta see a return on my investment, right? Uh, it's like when you sign up at the gym and you're paying every month and you're not going, like you feel like you got to take advantage of it. Right. So that was it. Then I also seen, uh, now he's a mentor, but back then, I, um, he was the only guy in Windsor that I seen wholesaling, uh, Ben humble, which, you know, so I seen this guy in Windsor crushing the wholesale game. Cause I see his ads everywhere. So I knew what he was doing. And at the time I was back to school. So it was a combination of that. And the fact that I spent all that money on that rich dad course, I wanted to get a return on. And also I, I came across another motivated seller before that first deal uh, earlier on in the year. And I thought that was going to be my first deal. So I was like so pumped because I, uh, it was so close. It was the first time where I see like uh, a house that was boarded up with a uh, for sale by owner sign. Uh, Cause usually for sale by owner, they're just asking for way too much money. So this is the first time I'm like, okay, this is a deal. And the, the guy was very difficult to deal with. He wanted me to buy the house without seeing it. But I felt like I was so damn close to doing my first deal that that kind of motivated me as well. I'm like, man, I'm so close. If I keep talking to these sellers, eventually one of these deals have to pan out. And eventually it did. So that's kind of what motivated me. And then continuing to reinvest in myself and then surrounding myself with other people that are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good point. It is once you do that deal that you get close, but it doesn't happen. It kind of gives you that basic proof of concept. You're like, oh my god, people actually do this, and and it can actually happen. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I'm like, man, something's got to give. Eventually, someone's gonna say yes and accept my offer, and it's gonna be a deal. So I just gotta keep going, and I'm just glad I, I kept on going and I got that first deal eventually. That's awesome. And actually, I feel like with your 10,000, to be honest, you did have a learning experience for them. You did OPM. How, like, how was that scary for you to ask your friend for $10,000? Or, or, like, was that something that felt natural to you? Or curious to hear your experience of that? Because I feel like a lot of people, if anything, find OPM the hardest thing, and, and you did it. <laughs> yeah, well, it was an interesting scenario. Like, my buddy... He, he actually came to Edmonton. He was staying with me, you know, crashing on the couch for a while. And uh, he had some money and some credit. And um, I tried to get him to come with me to the course. He wasn't really interested. And I came back. I was like, dude, you got to do this. Like, I was so fired up. And obviously, he's looking at me like, what are you talking about? Like, you're going to get ripped off. And uh, I just had to kind of put on the grab the, my sales skills and put them to use. And I just tried to explain to him like, man, they're going to teach us how to buy houses with n none of our own money. 
It's like, man, that's crazy. Like paying 10 grand, that's stupid. You could buy a house with that. You know, it's a down payment. And I try to explain to him like, hey, uh, yeah, we could buy a house. And then what? Then you're going to have to save up another 10 grand. It was like, that's going to take us forever. It's like, I, I try telling him, hey, uh, if we just invest in this and learn the, the skills and, and the knowledge and get connected with the right people, we can keep flipping houses with none of our own money. And then a couple more things were said and I got him on board. I, I did pitch in a little bit uh, for my tax refund money at the time. And uh, I just told him, hey, man, I'll pay you back no matter what, whether I do a deal or not. Um, and eventually just sold him on it. So I was glad that he was on board. That's awesome. That's yeah, that's great. I feel like that's a great uh, learning experience on its own. Uh, like I said, like, I just feel like with a lot of people, I, I would say, at least for myself, I know that was a struggle to start asking money from someone i don't know at least with family like my side of the family it, <laughs> like you never ask people for money you know it's like it's like such a taboo for us and so or even partnerships you know doing partnerships it was like you're, oh, you're gonna get scammed you know it's uh, like uh, don't trust anyone and then so it's such a conflict at least in me how about for partnerships have you done partnerships yeah, I've done several uh, JV deals, you know, joint ventures. So um, again, like I wasn't coming out of the gate doing that. Uh, it's kind of learning through the the mentorship and the coaching. Um, and just, yeah, like they, they have to make sense, obviously. And uh, once I realized like, hey, you could do a lot more business partnering up with people instead of trying to do everything your damn self, it just made a lot of sense, right? And the opportunities presented themselves uh so we did a deal in london uh and our partner had the had the deal and he was the active partner and we brought the money right so that one just made sense it actually closes uh in may um so that was one we did a very quick one uh me and uh deji um in windsor he got the deal i brought the funding and was the active as well and we just split down the middle 50 50. so yeah, I mean, if it makes sense, um, like, why not? You just do more deals. And the, the old saying, it's like, I'd rather have uh, a small piece of something than 100% of nothing. 100%. And uh, so it's interesting, your first deal was uh, you being a passive investor, because mine was also a thing, the same. And I think it's um, kind of a nice way to get into it, because you learn you know, from a person that's more experienced, how to deal with, let's say, how the JV structures and see how they work at things. And then you try to, you know, improve it for yourself and see like, how do I want to do it? How was your experience? Is that like, what was your, was that kind of your uh, thought way with it? Or, or was it just, you wanted to get into a good deal and you just found it and it was just an amazing deal that you wanted to be a part of? Well, by the time I did my first like partnership, um, I already had a few deals under my belt and just through like the coaching and stuff, it just made sense. It was kind of like obvious at that point, uh, but it took like maybe a year to get there because in the first year I was just wholesaling solo. Um, and then eventually I actually did a kind of a JV with my parents where I found the deal and then they funded it through their uh, line of credit, home equity line of credit. And my mom's a realtor, so she's in the real estate business. Uh, and the deal was a really good deal. It was a townhouse flip. We bought two from the same owner. Um, so that was kind of like the first one. And then after that, it's partnering up with people that are not family, right? And uh, most of these people are actually people that I met through different masterminds, right? Like the council and whatnot. So uh, it helps when you're partnering up with people with the same sort of mindset that have invested in themselves that they know like, hey, uh, this is going to be a win-win for both of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah 100 percent. they just yeah working with other investors they understand you know that for example um you know things may not always go smoothly there's always going to be problems but we're all there to like solve solve it whereas i feel like sometimes if you're doing someone from outside i feel like you need to do a little bit more babying like you know this is happening but don't worry like this is the plan and this is what's going to happen you know i feel like you have to baby the markets They'll stress about it for something that for us now is like not that big of a deal. But they're like, oh, my God, like, are we, you know, something bad going to happen? I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> we have a plan. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And also a lot of the time, maybe uh, in my experience, like 
people want to like save money. Like obviously you got to save, but like they're so focused on like saving pennies that like they're stepping over the dollars, right? It's like when you're doing a flip, yeah, you want to make sure it's cost effective. You have to turn a profit, but at the same time, you're not going to get the highest price if you're just like getting the cheapest material or the cheapest quality of work. Like all these things play a factor, right? So maybe a more experienced investor knows like, hey, yeah, we should invest in this versus maybe a newbie's like, no, like let's not spend money on that. They don't really take into account like, hey, the big picture, we're going to reduce the overall sales price if we cut corners. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. And even like also using your power team helps you a lot with that too. Cause I mean, I mean, you're more, you're all in Windsor, right? You're, you're not out in different areas. So you probably know your area very well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely know the city very well. Yeah. Cause, uh, cause uh, like, let's say with me, I lean on a lot of my power teams for specifically like what you say, right? Cause certain areas, for example, you know, it's actually, let's say worth it to do, um, underpinning and like make the basement ceiling higher where other places they're like realtors are like don't even you're not even going to make your money's worth and and uh and like that something like underpinning is insane and even more expensive now i think but back then it was like 50 60 now it's like 100 or something to get yeah. underpinning done uh so it's just um uh all these like little things and like that for you you're because you've been working in in windsor you know, you probably know everything about Windsor and the areas and like, like that, like no, when, you know, when to spend, where to spend your money. Definitely, definitely. And uh, yeah, like even when um, leads call us and we, we get an inbound lead from our marketing, uh, if they just mention a price and I know like the street, I could basically know if it's a good, good deal or a bad deal, or if it's like in the middle, like sometimes, you know, got to double check, but like, just on top of my head, just because I've been analyzing and in, in the market for for the last couple of years, it's you, you just start to know like what the what the going rates are, right? Like anything mm -hmm. under two hundred, it's still rare. People will probably argue that those deals don't exist, although we still come across them. Anything under two hundred is definitely a deal, unless it's like completely burned down and just like if it's a house and it's just needs some cosmetics under two hundred, it's basically a steal now. Uh, even under 300, depending on where, how many bedrooms and stuff like that, uh, it could be a very good deal. So just like knowing these numbers on top of my head versus going to a different market and having to rely more so on the the realtor or other members of the power team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. That That's one thing that I kind of, I'm all over the place. So I really rely on my teams to help me out a lot more. Where And, and stuff, there are obviously some areas that I'm very, you know, very knowledgeable in and I don't need that much help, but it is a, that's why that's, I think one of the good things about just sticking to one area, you know, you just become such an expert that eyes closed. You're like, what area? Oh, okay. It's this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but now recently the, the challenge has been the market is moving so fast and prices are climbing so quickly that before it might have been a deal under 300, but now even 350 might work. So um you know you don't want to get kind of stagnant and just rely you still double check and see hey what's the going rate today because the prices move very quick in ontario these days mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i completely agree <laughs> so what about for um like that now that you're growing bigger what skills have you started to realize you need to start learning now uh, to be able to just move forward and uh, continue growing. Yeah, now it's a different set of skills because, you know, I've done numerous deals. I, I can go and wholesale or flip a property. That's, you know, that's very doable. Um, but now it's really making that transition from being self-employed, uh, basically me as a one-man show, to creating a business where you have employees doing the the process and doing the deals. So different skill set for sure. That's more of like delegating and leadership and kind of casting your vision. Uh, so it's definitely challenging because uh, you can go a wholesale 10, 20 deals, no problem. But teaching someone else how to wholesale, it's really a different skill set. And I'm still trying to make that transition myself. It's a work in progress to uh, bring people on and, and get them trained and figure out a smooth process where they can kind of do the full uh, A to Z process without me. 
Yeah. And it's actually funny because when you go through that process, it, you realize like how much you know and how little comes out, like when you're explaining it. And then they'll ask you questions. And then you're like, oh my God, you know, there's a lot that, you know, you, when they start kind of like interrogating you and trying to learn from you is where you start realizing like how much you actually know and how much, you know, like how actually, like, yeah, just how much you know. Have you had that experience? Yeah, it's like uh, we do this stuff uh, every day now, right? So for us, it's like second nature, maybe even can say common sense. Uh, but for someone that's just starting out, you tell them like, hey, write the offer. It's like, okay, where do they even start? So uh, it definitely is a lot of that where <laughs> you're, you're trying to s tell them one thing, but you have another thing in your mind that maybe it's, isn't getting across to them. Um, so it's definitely... Uh, makes you realize you do know a lot, but you also have to kind of break it down to them in those micro steps and not assume that they know like what, what you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, exactly that assumption. You know, you start learning, I feel like how many assumptions you make, right? When they start questioning you, like, oh yeah, I just assume that you knew that. And then you're like, no, this is how you do it this way or that way. <laughs> and you realize like that, like the more experience you have, uh, you feel you. I, I don't know. At least with me, I notice when I'm talking to someone else, I don't realize I make assumptions and I'll say something, and then like that they question it, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's not like that's. A, I was assuming that you knew that, but that's not true. <laughs> right. There's always like more to it than we maybe uh, vocalize, and we're just not yeah. kind of explaining it all. So it's definitely we're something. Like, oh, it's simple. It's just this. And yeah. they're like, oh, but what about that, that, and that? Oh, yeah, you know, it's not that simple. <laughs> yeah. You know, once you do a couple uh, deals or a dozen deals, whatever, uh, yeah, it, just, it turns into that, like, oh, it's simple. You just got to uh, make the offer, and then you got to remove the conditions, and then you got to do this and that. And it's after you do it so many times, it's second nature. But I remember starting out, it's like, okay, what do I do now? What do I do now? So when you're bringing someone on board your team, uh, you really have to break it down for them in a very simple manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. So what kind of, during your journey, what kind of mindset shifts, like what were your biggest mindset shifts that you went through? Um, I mean, you touched on it earlier, like OPM, other people's money. Even though I got my buddy to kind of lend me that 10K to get in uh, the Rich Dad course, raising money for a real estate deal is different. And it's a lot more money, right? So that was kind of a mindset shift and using private money was a mindset shift because I was analyzing a lot of deals and uh, even with like bank financing at 3% or if I was you know, trying to be conservative using 5% uh, interest rate, um, it was very hard to find a deal that actually cash flowed, like very hard. And then I you know, surround myself with other investors that are doing you know, bigger things and uh, a lot more deals um, and they're doing deals with private financing at like 10% interest. And I would always like kind of like question like, man, how the heck are these guys doing it? D deals at 10% where I can barely find a deal that works at 3%. So that was a huge shift. And most deals are, most properties are not deals. You know, that's just a simple fact, but um, that was definitely a big shift. And for me, what I found makes sense uh, is the multifamily aspect because uh, once you have several units, you know, uh, paying rent, it makes the deal uh, work like a lot easier than just a single family home. So back in the day when prices were a lot cheaper in Windsor, there were single families that cash flowed. Today, there's barely any unless you get like a steal of a deal. Um, it's very, very hard to do, right? So now you got to look at kind of different opportunities, different properties, stuff that would make sense. And then eventually I found one, actually the, uh, where I am right now, I'm in one of my units of the fourplex um, house hacking. When I ran the numbers, I'm like, holy shit, this is a deal because uh, even with private money at 10%, I can afford to hold on to the mortgage because the tenants basically pay for the mortgage. So, you know, once you kind of realize that, you gotta find the right deal. And then if it works with private money, it's probably a very good deal. That was definitely a huge mindset shift. Mm -hmm, yeah. And it's very true that you say that about, you know, you hear people making all these deals and doing it with private money. And 
And it does make you kind of question. I probably got to what some points that I would be like, what are you seeing that I'm not seeing? So I was like, these are not working for me. And you hear so many people buying up so many deals. So it's a very interesting to say that because I also went through that episode of, or sometimes you need to do a double check. You know, you talk to like your peers and you're like, how are things going for you? Like, I feel like, I don't know what you think, but I feel like we're going through a pivotal point right now. I feel like we're going to be doing some kind of shifts in real estate. How are you, do you feel that's happening? Because I'm like in a completely research mode right now. And just uh, because like that, I think some of us are probably going to be pivoting our strategies. Yeah, I mean, the, the market's definitely changing. Uh, it's been appreciating like crazy, obviously. But even um, the first couple of months, January, February was super hot in Windsor. And now this end of March, it's kind of turning a little bit. I did notice more properties on the market, so that might have something to do with it. Bank of Canada increased uh, interest rates, so that might have something to do with it. Um, but still kind of early to really see, in my opinion, what's going to happen. Uh, even like week to week, there's different buyers and sellers, right? Like once people buy a property, unless they're an investor, like they're, they're good. So every week you have different people, especially in Windsor, we have a lot of people coming from the GTA area. So it kind of, it's hit or miss almost. It depends. Like if you get a bunch of people from Toronto that week, while your property's listed, it might get bid up. And then the following week, maybe uh, it slows down for a couple of weeks before we get another kind of wave. So we'll see. I got, I just got uh, my flip listed. So we'll see how that goes. But uh yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world too, geopolitical issues and whatnot. So I've been kind of doing some research as well on the macroeconomics just to see like, hey, can I see something coming that might, you know, put a spin to this market? So just trying to educate myself more and, and see what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and exactly what you said. I also think the same thing is still a little too early. Because I guess like you know, we're doing like we're I feel like we're like that in the middle of a transition right now, and it's just kind of like just giving it that little bit of more more time to just okay, what is the plan for this year? You know. <laughs> yeah, so I'm definitely gonna keep doing my thing, uh, focus on the active stuff, the wholesaling and flipping. Um, I do want to acquire eight units, kind of on the rental side as well. That's one of my goals. Um, but it definitely has me thinking like, hey, is is Windsor the right market for that? There's there's opportunities all over Canada, people going to Alberta, people going to the East Coast, a lot of opportunities in the US. Uh, there's opportunities in every market really, but you, you have to decide what makes the most sense for you. And I'm kind of just trying to see if Windsor is gonna be where I'm gonna stay for the next uh, time being, or if I'm gonna transition and go to a different market as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And so you were talking about your money mindset shift before that you went through. How were, like, how did you feel about it at the beginning? Was it like very scary or very stressful for you? And then now, like, like, what's the next money, like ceiling that you're trying to overcome? Yeah, it's definitely scary, like going forward with that uh, private mortgage. Um, I got the property vacant, so there was no money coming in. It was very expensive. It was about 3500 bucks a month, uh, just in interest payments, not to mention utilities, property tax, etc. So it was definitely scary. But, you know, talking to the mentor, him walking me through it, I remember having a one on one with him and, uh, you know, I was ready to leave the job. And then my excuse was, well, I don't want to quit till I get a mortgage. He's like, well, you could always get a private mortgage, right? I'm like, yeah, I guess I could. So eventually, like, just kind of talking it through with someone that is more experienced than I am, kind of gave me that comfort, like, hey, like, as long as it's a deal, as long as the numbers make sense, and I'm not kind of fabricating a story to make the deal work, if it makes sense, like, just do it. And I'm so glad I did because the market here is crazy. So, uh, you know, the, the value more than doubled in just over a year, maybe a year and a half. Obviously, put a lot of work into it, but uh, I'm just so glad I went ahead and took advantage of that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And a great point that you're saying, like a mentor really helps you out because sometimes you do need that person from the outside. 
just kind of looking in it because when you're in it, I feel like especially when things are getting tough or stressful or a lot of issues are coming up, I feel like blinders go up and you're just not able to see the full picture. Whereas your mentor can kind of put some reality into things because sometimes we become very unrealistic with our thoughts. Definitely. Sometimes go down that rabbit hole. Uh, and like you said, unrealistic thoughts that are probably not going to happen. And also, I think part of the issue is if you talk to the wrong people, they might kind of sway you in the wrong direction. Like your friends and family might love you, but if they if they're not really investing in real estate, especially full time, what do they really know about acquiring property with private mortgage? Probably nothing, right? So it's kind of goes back to your like upbringing and how you're raised. Like you said, you don't talk about money. You know, that's kind of typical for like immigrants. My, both my parents are, are foreigners, right? Uh, so they have a very different mindset when it comes to money and investing and whatnot. So you definitely don't want to take their advice. Uh, but my mentor who's been in my shoes and has done dozens, if not hundreds of deals with private money, uh, someone like that is definitely more qualified to walk you through it. Mm -hmm. 100%, yeah. And it's something that like that we don't realize until either someone tells us or, or like that you're with a mentor because it is, I think especially when we're a lot younger, you know, you feel, I feel like your parents are like the all knowing or something and they just know everything, you know? And so you just take what they say and you're like, oh yeah, that makes like a lot of sense, you know? And, and, uh, and then you don't, Start, I guess until you start really growing up, then you start realizing, okay, they don't actually know everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So the sooner we come to that realization, it's better. Uh, but yeah, definitely getting counsel for the from the right people that are qualified that have done what we're trying to do has been super helpful. And that's what I've noticed that all like these big time investors and business owners that I know that have done very well they all have mentors and coaches and you know I, i've heard several of them say like hey they've invested six figures and just their mindset and their coaching and whatnot and different masterminds so i started to see a pattern like hey this guy has a coach this guy's got a coach that guy's got a mentor and they're you know levels and levels above me and they're still hiring people to coach them and, and whatnot so just that, that kind of gave me more comfort and saying like, hey, like if I want to get similar results, I got to do similar things. And, you know, hiring a coach or a mentor is one of them. Yeah, 100 percent completely agree. And it's something that it just you see them like that, like let's say putting in six figures for their mentorship, but you see their growth, you see what's happening and the changes and you just kind of can't refute that. You're just like, I need a mentor too. You know, it's always, I guess, like not thinking we're always going to be an expert and allowing us to learn from others always and having that open mind is so important for us to grow, right? Because like that, like as we grow our businesses, things are, or even like as environments are even changing, we're having to pivot, we're having to grow, we're having to make different changes or grow our businesses and and things will always be new. If things aren't new, it's because we're not growing in, in, in both ways, either internally or in the business. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So you got to keep pushing. And, um, you know, I heard one guy say, you got to keep like upping your mentor, assuming you actually like catch up to them. Uh, you know, once you kind of catch up to their level, then you got to get a new mentor to unlock the next level. But until you really like surpass them, you should probably stick with them until you get the results that you want to see. And, you know, that's what I've seen from other successful people. And I just want to kind of follow in their footsteps and do mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. So the last burning question for you what do you see yourself doing in the next five to 10 years? What's your, and it can be like business and personal, like what are your big, big goals? So the, the goals are definitely to scale the wholesaling and flipping to an actual business where I have people and process in multiple markets. Uh, the goal would be, you know, 100K a month uh, at that level minimum. Uh, and to have that lifestyle business where, I can check in with the team virtually. 
a few hours a week, perhaps, and and travel, travel the world and continue to have a business that spits out income. So that's kind of my goal. Uh, once I achieve that, hopefully it'll be sooner <laughs> rather than later. Uh, but then uh, kind of branch out. Like once I achieve that goal, I'd like to get into other uh, businesses, different opportunities, whether that's crypto or a different kind of business. Um, I don't think it'll ever stop. You know, it's probably a lifelong journey. So uh, I think real estate's just the beginning. It's kind of getting my foot in the door of business. Once I kind of establish that real estate business that I desire, then it's like, okay, what's next? You know, whether that's tech, crypto, whatever it may be. And I would like to have that freedom uh, that financial freedom and that time freedom so that will allow me to travel, continue to make money and give back. 100%. Yeah, that's very, that's very true. Um, and I think like that, like what you're saying is very like, you know, you're an entrepreneur when it's like, you're not really thinking about doing a job, like get, getting money to just lay on the beach, do nothing. We're very like active people that want to do something in some way being like we gave ourselves this financial freedom to decide what do what do get, like to almost like learn about ourselves like now that i have the time like who am i what do i love what do i want to do and actually have the time and the money to be able to venture into those kind of things so that's awesome definitely yeah definitely i think entrepreneurs uh are definitely wired the same way and you know the old thought was maybe uh, 10 years ago, I, I was thinking, yeah, I would love to retire. But uh, I think that's very naive. Once you kind of get some more experience, you realize like, I'm never going to retire. People that <laughs> retire early tend to die uh, early as well, right? So you got to have a purpose in life. And uh, I don't think that ever stops. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that the definition of retiring is different, right? Because we think of retiring from the nine to five, you know, and being able to just do what we enjoy, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Life on our terms, right? Work because you want to, not because you have to. So that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm, 100%. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Alan. It was so much fun to chat with you and get to know you more. Thanks for having me, Diana. Looking forward to the next time we connect. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you guys all in the next episode. Bye, Alan. Bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, I can never disconnect. There we go.